Amen. Well, we are going to be continuing our series here this morning on money. And so, so um, like, I, like I've been saying every time we talk about um, money here in this, in this series, um, the reason why we're preaching and teaching on money is because I had felt a, a need to correct uh, something that had been missing from my teaching ministry for many years. You see, for many years I had avoided preaching and teaching on money specifically because I didn't want to be perceived as one of those people who just all they talk about is money. Even if I had only talked about it once or twice, I didn't want to talk about it at all uh, because I'd been in environments and I'd been part of uh, communities and that sort of stuff where it felt like um, people were abused around the idea of money. People were guilted around the idea of money. And I never wanted to be that. Um, but it was last December... Last December, when <clears throat> I was listening to another preacher talk about how they had never preached on eschatology uh, because uh, they never wanted to be that guy. And after 35 years, the Lord <laughs> brought them to a place of correction where they were actually going, well, I, I, had, I had disregarded and failed to teach this certain segment of the counsel of God uh, because of my own fears or my own, un my own unwillingness to actually teach it. I didn't want to be that person. And, and I felt convicted last December that that was me, specifically on the area of money. And so this is my attempt to correct that. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to preach and teach about money forever, but uh, we're now in Sermon 3. I think there's maybe one more, but who knows? Uh, the Holy Spirit might have me preach on money for the rest of my life. And you're all like, yay! Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, so we're preaching and teaching on money this morning, and so we, we talked about in previous uh, sermons, we've talked about pre in previous sermons about the idea that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, and how it's really important that you be very mindful where you're storing up your treasure, whether it's here in earthly wealth and here in earthly goods and riches, uh, or if you're actually storing up your wealth in heaven. We, we, we delved into that a little bit. Uh, last time we spoke, we, we talked about how you actually need to be able to trust God in your finances. That, that in being a disciple of Jesus, in being a disciple of Jesus, it, we need to actually surrender all parts of our lives to Him, and that includes the area of our finances, and that means we have to learn to trust the Lord for provision, and we talked about how we can actually trust Him for provision. When we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we can actually trust the Lord to take care of all the other things that we need, what we're going to eat, what we're going to live, where we're gonna, where we're gonna, what we're going to dress, and, and, and all these sorts of things. And so we talked about that, and so this morning we're going to continue, we're going to talk about how to give to God. How to give to God. And I'm not talking about a payment plan. I'm not talking about where well, you can fill out a deposit slip or anything like that. I'm not talking about God's banking system and how to make a deposit. I'm talking about the attitudes and, and, and the, the way in which we go about giving to God. And that's what we're going to be talking about here this morning. And as, as always, when we talk about money in, 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 in this series, I want to make it very clear. If at any point you feel like you're being manipulated or coerced into giving by me, I want to encourage you, take the teaching and apply it to your life, but just make sure that you go and give the money somewhere else, okay? I want to remove all self-interest from this because my goal is not to get money out of you. My goal is for you to faithfully live before the Lord with your finances, okay? <clears throat> and so... So let's, let's, let's get into it. So how to give to God. Well, the first thing, the first point I would like us to uh, address this morning is, is the fact that we need to prayerfully give to God. We need to prayerfully give to God. Why prayerfully? Why prayerfully? I don't specifically have a verse for you this morning, but the reason why I want you to prayerfully give to God is because I want you to actually go before the Lord, ask Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into how it is you should be giving, how it is you should be stewarding the resources that he has placed in your hands. Because as we've discussed before, money is very much a heart issue. Money is very much a heart issue. And the moment you start talking about money, a lot of emotions can come up in people's hearts. A lot of ideas can come up in people's hearts. Money is one of those things that seems to touch on some of the most root cause, some of those root parts of our heart. Um, as I was preparing this, I remembered a quote from a movie of the great philosopher, um, Big Worm, if you can put that quote up there. Playing with my money 
is like playing with my emotions. That's Big Worm, the great philosopher from the movie Friday. Um, don't go watch it, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a good, um, it's a good quote uh, to illustrate the point. When playing with the money, <laughs> playing with my money is like playing with my emotions. And this morning, I want you to be prayerful about where your money is going. Prayerful about how it is God wants you to steward your money. Um, because I want you to actually be doing it from the place of the heart and never out of coercion or manipulation or anything like that. So each of us as individuals needs to come to a conscience decision about how we are going to approach giving before the Lord. We need Holy Spirit to instruct us how we are to give. Because you see, there's a number of different approaches that Christians have taken in the last 2,000 years when it comes to giving. We can just chuck up the slide prayerfully again. Um, so, so one approach is the one of tithes and offerings based on the Old Testament model of giving. Um, another approach is the communist approach uh, based on, say, in Acts 2. They say, look what happened at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, and see how the immediate community of, of, of believers lived. It says that they actually sold all their possessions and, and their properties and they actually gave and distributed to everybody as they had need and they had all things in common. Um, and so people have felt like, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to go and live in a commune type environment where, where we just have all things in common. That's, that's one way in which people have, have uh, desired to steward their resources. Um, the, then, there's, then there's the approach that some people feel like they might need to take where Jesus gives this advice to the rich young ruler. Where he says, look, this one thing you lack. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and just come and follow me. And for some people, they have felt this deep conviction from the Lord that in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus, it requires them to give away everything that they own and just go and do whatever it is they feel like the Lord is telling them to do. And that, that, that living in a, from a place of uh, poverty is actually the thing that the Lord would have them to do. And then there's another approach, one which I like, which is the being generous in all things approach. That we don't live under a law anymore, but we live uh, from a principle of the kingdom of generosity in all things. And so different people, different people will, from the scriptures, derive different principles by which they will steward their resources and by which they will give. And I don't want to simply lay down a law for you here this morning about how it is that you should do it. But I do want you to prayerfully go before the Lord and ask him, Holy Spirit, how do I give? How should I be giving? How should I be generous? How should I be storing the resources that you have actually placed in my hands? <clears throat> the other reason why I believe that we need to be prayerful is because I believe that for many people, they have not really taken seriously offering their finances up to the Lord. I, I heard this quote just recently. He said, you know, a person's wallet is the last thing to be converted. And I believe that for many of you, as you relinquish control over that area of your life back to God, that he is going to invite you to become more generous. And that what that looks like, something that, and, and what that is, is something that has to be done in conversation with the Holy Spirit as he leads you. Um, but I imagine this journey and process will look different for different people. And it must be a Holy Spirit-led approach. The Holy Spirit is the only one who is actually going to change your heart. That's, that's the thing we got to remember. Giving and generosity, it's a heart posture. It's a thing that comes out of the heart. It, it's not, it's not a, a rigid rule. Um, according to, uh, when we talk about generosity, according to an article posted um, on the, the Tithely website around giving, um, they talk about how the average giving during the Great Depression was 3.3% of people's income. And that today... Amidst all of our wealth, it's 2.5%. Um, so people during the midst of one of the greatest economic crises facing the Western world, uh, they still, on a percentage basis, outgave uh, the church today. Um, but it has to be a Holy Spirit-led approach rather than a value-received approach. The reason why I say that is this, is I want you to go before the Lord and go, God, how much should I give? How much should I give away? Where do you want me to store my resources? Because one of the dangers is, is that we can, we can turn giving into a, a payment for services received. I, look, I remember, I remember 
um, being in certain conversations and overhearing certain things about how, um, how basically as, as, as a church you would time when you would take your offering up based upon how good you think the preacher was going to be. So if, 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 they were not, if you weren't so sure the preacher was going to be really good, you take it up before the preaching. But if you were certain the preacher was really good, you take it up after the preaching because everyone's going to want to give to that, right? And sometimes people, do you know, you hear these horror stories from pastors who've been around the traps for a while that, you know, you have people who are in, in your church who treat your sermon and that they'll pay you based on how good they thought your sermon was that Sunday. And that was what they would put in the offering box. We don't want to be like that as people. We want to be, be people that when we give, we give freely to the Lord. Um, and that has to be a Holy Spirit driven process. So the second, the second way, uh, the second point on how we actually give to God is sacrificially. We give to God sacrificially. Um, I, want, I want us to actually read um, this passage from the book of Mark, uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 41. Mark's gospel says this, um, speaking of Jesus, says, sitting across from the temple treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they gave out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty... But she, out of her poverty, has given everything she had, all that she had to live on. There's a couple things that I think this passage teaches us. Firstly, the first thing I think we need to notice is that it's not the size of the gift that matters. But God evaluates things completely differently to us. Do you, do you see that? Do you see that God actually evaluates things by a very different set of scales than what human beings evaluate things? Because you see, Jesus can see all these people coming in with stacks of cash, dropping it in the offering box at the temple. And then he sees this, this widow come in with her last two pennies and drops them in the box. And he says, look, you see that? That was more than all the rest. That was more than all the rest. And so one of the things I want you to realize is that whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, do not judge the size of your offering based on how much money it actually is. Because that's not how God judges things. God judges things according to the heart, not according to outward appearances like us. Second thing I want us to notice, second thing, oh, actually, one of the, one of the commentators I, I, I read on this, um, they, they said this, um, what, on this uh, verse, uh, he notes that while the offering of the rich would have been heard in the temple coffers because of the many coins dropped into the box, the sound of the widow's offerings was heard in heaven. Um, the second thing I want you to notice is that the widow gave to the point that she was in a place of dependency on the Lord. She gave to the point that she was in a place of dependency on the Lord. For us, we need to understand that one of the purposes of giving is to place our hearts in a place of looking to the Lord for provision. In, in the parable of the sower, in, in the third soil, you remember the third soil is the soil that has the weeds that come up in the heart. And in that, in that parable, it talks about how those weeds that end up choking the life out of the kingdom are the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth. You see, money has this great ability to begin soothing our hearts that all things are well, that all things are right, um, that, that I'm safe and I'm secure because I've got money in the bank. Um, and that's one of the things that, that money, that, that one of the temptations that money actually poses to us. It, it, it creates in us an independence apart from the Lord. And one of the things that, that giving sacrificially does is it brings us back and brings our heart rather back into that place of dependence upon the Lord for his provision. Um, <clears throat> so when we give, I think it's, important, it's an important principle to give sacrificially. Now I am not saying, what I'm not saying, the lesson from this story is that you need to put all your money in an offering somewhere. That's not what I'm saying. 
you know, because remember, the, 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 passage, the passage just before this is the warning against the scribes and the Pharisees who actually devour widows' houses. Um, and I think it's because those particular people were happy to take money from poor people, knowing that they were being impoverished to enrich themselves. We don't want to be like that as a community of faith. All right? We don't want to simply take from the poor and tell them, well, you know, it's just going to help you be dependent upon the Lord. Right? We want to take the principle for what it is, and this is why it has to be prayerfully, and it has to be a Holy Spirit-driven process, that you come to a place of conviction by the Holy Spirit about what it is you will give. Um, but I think in the process, it is important that we feel the sacrifice. I think it's important that we actually feel the sacrifice of giving when we give to the Lord. Um, King David in 2 Samuel, um, he, he sins against the Lord. Uh, I, th I think it's, he sins against the Lord because he takes a census, and now there's a plague in the land. And Gad, actually, I'll just read the passage to you. It's in, in uh, 2 Samuel 24. It says, Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arun... Ar oh, man, it's like trying to pronounce Samaria. Uh, Aruna, the Jebusite. David went up in obedience to Gad's command, just as the Lord had commanded. Aruna looked down and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So he went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, Why has the Lord King, why has my Lord the king come to his servant? David replied, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, so the plague on the people may be halted. Aruna said to David, My Lord the king may take whatever he wants and offer it. Here are the oxen for a burnt offering and the threshing sledges and oxes yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Aruna, gives everything here to the king. Then he said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. The king answered Aruna, no, I insist on buying it from you at a price, for I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David, no doubt, was wealthy, not only financially, but because of his position in society as the king, he had this man's possessions laid at his feet. Uh, th this man, Aruna, was, was simply, hey, you know, David, let me help you out. I will give you everything. I will give you, the, I will give you the land. I'll give you the wood you need. I'll give you the oxen that you need. And David understood from a principled place that it was inappropriate for him to give to the Lord in such a way that it didn't cost him something. And so when we give to the Lord, I... We have, Anna and I have operated out of this principle that when we give, we've got to kind of feel it. Do, do you understand what that, that, that is? You, you, have you experienced that before where it's like you, you have a, a settled amount in your heart that you're going to give or you're going to set aside for the Lord and, it, and, it, and you don't want to? It's, it's, enough that it, it's enough that you'll miss it. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's not, it's, you know, for us, it's probably not a cup of coffee, all right? But it is enough that we're like, this hurts a little bit. We feel, we feel the pinch of that sacrifice. I think it's important that we give, and when we give, we need to ask ourselves this question. Is this costing me anything? Is this costing me anything? Or am I just giving out of my abundance? Because remember, the, the widow, when she gave, she gave, out of, she gave out of everything that she had to the Lord. She placed herself fully on the dependence of the Lord for her provision. Whereas the reason why the other people who had given in the temple were not commended in the same way by the Lord, it's because they gave out of their surplus. They had everything they needed and some, and they just simply gave out of the end some. And so this is why... Uh, we need to ask ourselves, in our giving before the Lord, in the way we steward our finances before the Lord, is this costing me anything? Do I feel that sacrifice when I give? The third point I want us to consider is that we need to be giving first fruit Ali. So, just prayerfully, sacrificially, and first fruit Ali. Um, I don't know, I felt like it needed to keep going. That's, so we'll, we're creating words here. <clears throat> and, and this is a principle. This is a principle we see in the, in the Bible. 
And it's the principle of the offering of the first fruits to the Lord. It's the principle of offering the first fruits to the Lord. In Proverbs 3, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your harvest, of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Um, and uh, I also want to read a passage in Genesis 4, uh, uh, and just two verses, 3 and 4. Um, and, and it's the story of Cain and Abel. And I want, I want us to actually unpack a little bit of this. It says, In the course of time, Cain worked the ground. In the, uh, in the course of time, Cain presented... Oh, I wrote that twice. Uh, in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. And so this principle of, of first fruits, this principle of first fruits is something, um, <clears throat> is something that is throughout the scriptures as one of the things that is, is a sign of actually honoring the Lord. Consider, consider Cain and Abel here for a moment, right? Now, I've heard a number of different explanations as to why it is God looked favorably upon Abel's offering and not favorably upon Cain's offering. I've heard the explanation that it was, it was actually because Abel offered uh, a, a sacrifice of uh, meat uh, and, and of the fat portions, and that was appropriate uh, for the type of offering that he was supposed to give, whereas, whereas Cain didn't offer the appropriate um, meat sacrifice in order for... Uh, but in the appropriate animal sacrifice in order for it to be accepted. Um, that could be it. Um, that could be part of it. But just from within the narrative itself, there's two key, there's some distinctions between Cain's offering and Abel's offering. You see, it says Cain, he worked the ground, and it says he just offered some of his, his produce to the Lord. Just offered some of it. We're not told what portion. We're not told how much. He, he, we're just told he offers some of his, his, um, his produce to the Lord. But in contrast to that, what we're told about Abel is that he offered the firstborn. He offered the first, the first fruits of his flock. And not just the first fruits of his flock. He even offered the fat portions of that first fruit. You see, Abel's offering was given in such a way that it was the first fruits of his flock. Whereas we're told Cain's was just some. I think this is probably getting closer to perhaps why it is God looked favorably upon Abel's offering as opposed to Cain's. Because again, it wasn't necessarily the item that was given or how much was given. Cain was a man who worked the ground. Grain and seed, that was his, that was his business. So it's totally appropriate for Cain to actually give out of his produce in that way. And Abel... He, he, was a, he was a shepherd. He kept animals. It was totally appropriate for him to give animals. The difference between the two was that one just gave some, and the other gave of the first portion of his flock and the fat portions as well. He gave from a position that, Lord, I will give you the first and the best from my heart. That's the difference. That's the difference. This is a principle that Anna and I have practiced. Anna and I have practiced um, for since, since we've been married. Is that right? Right? Yes. Since we've been married. Um, I remember practicing this um, back when I was, you know, a, a brand new Christian and I was working full time, bringing home, I think, about $320 a week after tax. You know, I had one of those stellar factory jobs that, <laughs> that was like, you know, working full time uh, just to bring home about $300 a week. And, um, um, but I always gave to the Lord out of the first portion. Before I spent anything else, before I paid any of my bills, I gave out of what I'd been given to the Lord. Um, and so what that means for Anna and I is we continue this practice today. It's the principle of first fruits giving. And what that means is that when we receive money, before we do anything else with it, we take the first portion, we offer that to the Lord. We actually give in the offering to the Lord. Um, so this means that for our ordinary income, now I told you that, that I'm not going to teach you to practice tithing, you know, which, is, which is giving a tenth, but we give a tenth, right? Um, we take, uh, uh, from our ordinary means of income, we take a 10% on average. Uh, sometimes it's a little more because we, we like to round. Um, and we put that in the offering. And then sometimes we actually receive money from other sources. Sometimes we're gifted money. Sometimes, you know, we'll sell something. Or sometimes, you know, we'll do a little bit extra work here or there for somebody. And, and some other money will come in. And we take 
a portion from that money as well, and we actually set it aside into a blessing fund. So if any of you have ever received flowers from Anna and I, from Anna mostly, um, <clears throat> or a gift or these sorts of things, that's come out of the blessing fund. And, and, and the purpose of that in our lives is actually to set aside money that we keep set aside for the purpose of blessing people as the Lord leads. Anyways, that, that, that's, that's one of the things that, that we do. We practice first fruits giving to the Lord. Um, and the reason why we do this is because we believe it's a principle that the Lord honors. We believe it's a principle that the Lord honors. We believe that's why Cain, uh, that's why the Lord looked upon Abel's offering as acceptable and Cain's offering he didn't regard. In the book of Hebrews, it'll actually say it's by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice. It was an act of faithfulness to God that he offered the first fruits and he offered the best of the first fruits, the fat portions to the Lord. And I would encourage you in your giving, in your stewarding your finances, that you would actually give your best to the Lord. Give your best to the Lord and trust him, trust him to actually provide for you more abundantly than you could imagine. I would encourage you to do this as well with your, your times of prayer and Bible reading. For some people, the best, the best time when they have the most energy and all this sort of stuff is the first part of the day. Right? For some people, it's in the evening. Some of you are night owls. I used to be a night owl till I had kids. And then, then someone came along and shot the night owl. Um, <laughs> and, and now I'm more of a morning person because I have to be. Um, <laughs> but... For, for whatever, whatever time is the best time of day for you, when you're the most energized and you're the most awake and attentive, I would encourage you to even consider giving that time to the Lord, giving that time of devotion to Him. When you're the most clear, when you've got the most energy, when your life is, when your heart is the most full, give that to Him in prayer, give that to Him in worship. And I would encourage you that in your finances, give first to the Lord before you do anything else. And Anna and I, and I know many of you, because since we started this series, many of you have come with testimonies from how the Lord has provided financially for you, miraculously for you. Finances have come out of nowhere for you. I, I know that when we actually give to the Lord and we trust Him in our finances, He does provide. It's not always the way that we need. Or it's, sorry, it's not always the way that we like, you know. But He does provide for our needs. And He does care for us in ways um, that... Just to be completely honest, is sometimes downright miraculous. So I want to encourage you to give from the first fruits of the lead to the Lord. And fourth and finally for this morning, um, we want to give to the Lord joyfully, because God loves a cheerful giver. Second um, Corinthians nine verse seven says, "Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver." Giving should be done cheerfully, and here's why. It's got to come from your heart. You'll notice this is the drum that we've been beating the whole time. It's got to come from your heart. Remember, it doesn't matter the size of the offering. It doesn't matter the size of the offering because that is not how God judges things. God judges the heart. Is your heart yielded to Him? Is your heart gr grateful to Him? Is your heart willing to actually serve him with your finances, even if he called you to give it all away. And there have been many Christians in church history who the Lord has called to give it all away. I remember um, the, the story of the missionary C.T. Studd. I believe it's C.T. Studd. He was, he was part of the Cambridge Seven, I think. And I was, he was a famous cricketer, very, very talented, was very successful and had money. Um, but the Lord was calling him to the mission field and, and the Lord had paired him with a wife um, who was also being called to the mission field. And she said to him, I will not marry you unless you give all of your money away. And so he's like, fine, my love, I will give all my money away and just some for us to get married. And she said, no, I will not marry you unless you give it all away. And so he did. And then he went and sowed his life into the mission field. Sometimes that's what the Lord is going to ask some of you to do, to give it all away. And you're going to have to trust the Lord to be faithful in that process. I, 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 don't, I don't want to pull any punches here this morning and say that that will be easy for you. But just remember, it's God who judges the heart. It's the heart. It's the heart. He's always going after the heart. The heart is the temple of the Lord. The heart is the place from which you worship. It's the heart that matters behind all things. It's the heart in which you do it. And so when you give, 
you need to be giving joyfully. And the reason why you need to be giving joyfully is because that will tell you where your heart is really at. That will tell you where your heart is really at. That's why it's so important that you come with a, with a Holy Spirit conviction about how it is you're going to give. Because it's only the Holy Spirit who's going to change your heart and give you that conviction. Right? If, you, if you're giving because a preacher or a teacher stands up in front of you and says, Hey, give your money now. We're going to send a basket around. And you're sitting there feeling guilty or pressured or anything like that. It, your heart's not in it. And I would, I would encourage you, if you're in that situation... Don't give. It's better for you not to give in that situation, if you're not giving faithfully from the heart, than to give out of compulsion or to give out of a place of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Right? Don't ever give out of a sense of religiosity. Only give if you're giving from the heart. Only give if you're giving from the heart. You need to come to a place and see your giving as an act of worship. As an act of worship to God. We're not making offerings like in the Old Testament. We're not making fellowship offerings. We're not offering bulls and rams. We're not making offerings in order to bring ourselves into a right standing with God. We have the once for all time sacrifice in the Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate that. We champion the cross. We thank him for it. But when we give out of our finances, we, we want to give joyfully. As an offering, not a saving offering. You're not saved by giving money. We, you know, we're not. Uh, who, who is it? The, um, the, fa the famous singer. Um, at the end of his life, he gave all of his money to the church, and said, "I will be the first man to buy my way into heaven." They still accepted his money. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't remember. Oh, he's so famous. You'd know who he was if I told you his name. Anyways. <laughs> But I want you to come to a place where your giving is actually an act of worship. And then you do it joyfully. Just like you come on a Sunday morning. And I know all of you come with your hearts prepared to worship the Lord. Amen. <laughs> and all of you come with, with hearts full of joy to worship the Lord. Amen. Hey, we're getting there. We're warming it up. We're warming it up. Some Sundays you guys take a while to get started. Hey, just going to be honest. It's like it's in... <laughs> Elliot's got to get going to help get your hearts moving. Is that, is that just being too honest? <laughs> but we want to give joyfully to the Lord because he's worthy. And it should be our joy to give. It should be our joy to give to him, to steward our finances in such a way that we're honoring the Lord with the first portion. It should be a joy to actually see God use us to bless people. You know, either bless people through the church community that you give to, or bless people through giving away money or buying flowers and all these sorts of things. I, again, I can't remember who, who, who originated this quote, but, but it's, the, it's the quote, is like, you know, the person who said the money can't buy happiness has never given enough of it away. <clears throat> it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And for those of you who have practiced generosity, your heart will know that. Your heart will know the joy of being able to be a blessing to people through your finances. And so I want to encourage you. Give joyfully. God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. It's not because you're compliant, but because your heart's actually in the right place. Amen? Awesome. Well, I'll get, you, uh, get the worship team to come up.